I think we should be starting. Um, I would like to welcome you all to not your usual nano seminar. Uh, uh, it's uh, we decided uh, um, to change the theme um, to a, a more relevant to the to COVID related times, and it is with uh, great pleasure and honor that we have a friend, a colleague of our Department of Environmental Health and and the School of Public Health, Ed Nardell. Uh, I will keep my introductions uh, short. I won't do any any good uh, to Ed. He has a, um, a long and very interesting CV. Um, Ed's interests are primarily in the airborne transmission of, of diseases, and um, both him and Mel first, uh, a long time faculty in our department, uh, have pioneered uh, the work on on um, UV as an uh, airborne uh, intervention approach. We know a lot about um, SARS-CoV-2 virus nowadays, uh, and more importantly, uh, we know that it, it, it's, um, it has an airborne uh, route of transmission, um, which makes it very uh, interesting and challenging at the same time uh, to deal with. So um, UV is one of the um, um, effective intervention technologies that can be used to um, inactivate the virus in, in the air. And, and without further ado, I will um, pass the, the microphone to, to Ed um, and give us the, uh, his 45-minute uh, presentation on germicidal air disinfection in the time of coronavirus, as this title. Uh, uh, keep your questions uh, at the end, you can use the chat room uh, to, to pose your question. Uh, it's going to be a 45 minute uh, talk followed by 15 minutes uh, of, of, of a discussion. Ed, the, the mic is yours. Thank you. mute myself. There we go. Can you see my slides? They look great, look great on my end. Okay, great. All right, well, thank you, uh, Phil, and for this opportunity to discuss um, something I've been working on for a very long time, and that is air disinfection. Um, just on this very first slide, you can see an image on the left-hand side of the screen of a typical upper room germicidal fixture. And most of this talk will be about that available technology. I will, at the end, talk about some of the newer technologies, the uh, so-called FAR UVC, which doesn't require confinement to the upper room. But I will limit it to the end because right now, there's very limited availability of this technology and the cost is quite high but I will talk about it uh, because it's exciting. On the right-hand side of your screen, you see a, a, the spectrum of, of, of light, and you see the visible portion, and you see the uh, ultraviolet portion, and uh, you see that UV is divided into UV A, B, and C. UV is in A and B are in sunlight, UV C is not because it's so reactive that it's essentially none of it reaches the earth. If we want to use UVC for its germicidal properties, we have to use a lamp to create it. Uh, now, I am not, let's see if, okay. I, okay. So, uh, conflicts of interest. I don't have any uh, current or past conflicts of any of the products that I'm be talking about today. I am doing some uh, I've done a lot of free technical advice and will be compensated for a project that's coming up on COVID reopening, and I may do more of that in the future, but right now I have no conflicts of interest. Uh, in terms of uh, other information, apart from the fact that this will be recorded, uh, about in, in mid-May, the, the Illumination Engineering Society, which is the premier lighting so professional society, did a four-hour webinar on UV with really in-depth with world experts 
on all aspects. And I did the opening talk, which is pretty much what I'm going to do here today. And you see here also a link to uh, all of the IES UV related documents, including uh, safety documents, which I'll refer to later. Uh, IES is a impartial professional society. Sounds very much like the International UV Association, which is actually a, a trade group mostly focused on induct UV. And actually the website contains a fair amount of misinformation. And I, I wanted to call that to your attention because it, it sounds like a, a major organization, but it is actually not. Uh, this is not new technology uh, we're talking about. Um, this textbook by Matthew Lukish is, is dated 1946. And it has been in use pretty much since then. Uh, basically, or before that, I even, so 75, 100 years of use of upper room germicidal UV. And um, it's been long known to kill bacteria and fungi and to in inactivate respiratory viruses. We probably don't talk about killing viruses because we don't think of them as alive in the usual sense of an organism. Water uh, purification is the current major use of germicidal UV. It's pretty much standard practice for all water treatment plants to have uh, germicidal UV as part of the process. Before antibiotics and vaccines, air disinfection was hoped for as a way to prevent respiratory illnesses in schools and hospitals and other public buildings. And I'll show you in a minute some data that it reduced measles in a suburban Philadelphia schools in the 1930s and 40s. Actually, I think it was in the 40s. Um, and in the resurgence of uh, TB in the United States between 85 and 92, there was renewed interest in, in UV, and that's how I got involved in it for tuberculosis control. Unlike COVID, tuberculosis is a very clearly an airborne infection. So it sort of makes it a little easier to focus on the airborne component. COVID, as you know, has had a, um, there's somewhat a little controversy over it. WHO initially said it's only spread by large droplets and touching, but more recently it become, it's becoming clearer and clearer that aerosol is a, uh, a, a spectrum of, of sizes and that the airborne component, that those particles which remain suspended in air for longer uh, duration and can travel further are also uh, likely playing a role in the spread of uh, COVID-19, some people think it's the predominant way it spread. Right now, germicidal UV has, has still in use widely, uh, to some degree in the United States, and there are four or five manufacturers of UV fixtures, but its main use is in high burden countries around the world for tuberculosis. Just to uh, tantalize those who are interested in this for, for a public building school, this is the data from Wells and Wells uh, 1942, showing in these histograms the cases of measles in two different schools outside of Philadelphia, Germantown and Swarthmore Public Schools. And in the upper um, diagram, and I think you can see my arrow, you um, see that the primary classes, which are more vulnerable to, to measles because they've not been exposed as long as uh, children in the upper classes, they were the classes that had the UV, and these were the controls. And you see that uh, there was a great reduction in measles among the, in the classes in both schools where UV was in place. Upper room fixtures, um, there were high ceilings at the time. These were very simple fixtures aimed upwards. Um, as I mentioned, TB is the main application of this technology. If you look in the upper left-hand corner, you see crowded waiting room, a corridor, then the transmission of an airborne infection or those circumstances is, is, is really challenging. And in many hospitals around the world, people enter hospitals with no TB at all or drug susceptible, T, uh, drug susceptible TB and come out with drug resistant TB, the result of reinfection. And at one point, uh, Gila Kaplan, who was the scientific director, director of the um, Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, basically said about the TB epidemic, it's all about transmission and UV has been a 
of one of the things that we've been able to do. Now, for 10 years at the School of Public Health, and Mel first and I started this, we had a course called Building Design and Engineering Approaches to Airborne Infection Control. And we taught engineers and architects from all around the world, and we taught them about natural ventilation and about mechanical ventilation to the extent that it's available. And in the bottom two uh, panels, you see two buildings that were built by architects. Uh, this architect here that I'm pointing at, uh, um, designed this hospital in Karachi, Pakistan with outdoor waiting areas and wind scoops and using building design pr um, uh, techniques that were learned in our class. And, and here in uh, Butaro Hospital in Rwanda, organization I'm associated with, Partners in Health, uh, designed this hospital with a slope ceiling um, and for natural ventilation. And you also see, pointed at by the arrows, upper room germicidal fixtures to further enhance air disinfection. And in particular, when you use natural ventilation, sometimes there's no air moving, moving or it's raining or it's cold and the, and the um, uh, <clears throat> windows get closed. Now a new problem, and in, not as much a problem in the United States, but it is one in India and other warm countries, that there is skyrocketing sales of air conditioning, as you see on the right-hand panel here, this is from 2010 to 2015, but I'm sure the last five years, if anything, is more as it continues to get warmer and more humid in places like India. And the red bars are split system air conditioners illustrated in the other side of the panel. You see an outdoor condenser and coolant going up to an indoor um, uh, device which only moves air in the room, does not bring any outside air in. And of course, when you turn on an air conditioner, you have to close the windows. So many, many hospitals and other public buildings in, in India are, um, rely on outdoor ventilation, not only for, not only for comfort, but for um, infection control. And as soon as you close the windows, you get a dramatic change. And we did a little demonstration of that in South Africa. We had five people in a uh, office room uh, we had a window open and the air conditioner off and we equilibrated to a CO2 level of about 800 as you can see here. Then we uh, had a washout period where um, people left and the levels came down. And then we closed the window and turned on the air conditioner and you see the skyrocketing uh, increase in CO2 as people are generating CO2 and there's no outdoor ventilation and they're cool. Um, but they're not, uh, they're rebreathing each other's air. So the rebreathed air fraction increases. And I would estimate here that in just an hour, the rate of uh, the risk of tuberculosis or any other airborne infection increased by at least two or three times. And if this continued, as you can see, there's no really sign of getting anywhere near a plateau, probably four or five times before you eventually plateau with um, a much higher risk of airborne infection. Now, there are only three approaches uh, to providing air disinfection in buildings that are practical. Uh, there's another one that's not so practical. There's natural ventilation, we've been talking about a little bit, dependent on conditions, and, and we don't do that very much in the United States, at least for public buildings, but in many parts of the world they do. There's mechanical ventilation that we rely on, and much of the poorer world does not. And there are room air cleaners, I've depicted, pictured one here on the left, where you take in air and put it through a HEPA filter or through UV bank and throw it back into the room. And then there's upper room germicidal UV. And here's a uh, close up of a wall fixture that is generating UV behind this panel uh, or the grid of louvers. Now, uh, the problem with the uh, air cleaners is that the, <coughs> the exhaust and the discharge are very close to each other. You tend to get a, re a lot of recapture of air that has just been filtered. But more importantly, there's a limited volume that you can put through this device compared to the volume of the room. And that's what we call, as you know, air changes per hour. So um, <clears throat> as we look at these alternatives to natural ventilation, um, mechanical ventilation is either absent in many parts of the world or poorly maintained. Uh, you can achieve the 6 to 12 air changes recommended by CDC, but it usually requires a special uh, air handling system. You don't get that out of your 
usual office building air conditioning, um, but you can do it. It's costly if you're bringing in cool air that has to be heated or hot air that has to be cooled. Room air cleaners, we'll talk more about, are flow limited. How much, can you, how much air can you put through such a device? Usually in our experience around the world, you're adding one or two air changes per hour, depending on the room volume. And again, there's a problem of recapture. Now UV can be used, sorry about that. Uh, UV can be used and it can be used in ducts. But as I like to tell people, if I have infectious uh, TB or COVID and we're in the room together, it's not very comforting to know that when the air leaves, it's gonna be disinfected. For optimal protection, you want to disinfect the air uh, within the room where you, uh, where the source and the person who is at risk are both at the same time. So you need real-time air disinfection in occupied rooms. Now the upper room uh, UV is, we'll be talking about, are fixtures that are above people's heads because we can't expose people to even the low levels of of, uh, or rather the low penetrating UV that we'll be talk talking about, dermocidal UV. So we keep it above people's heads and we account, we um, require mixing between the upper and ro lower room to achieve the levels of air disinfection that are required in the lower room. And that works quite well as I'll show you and it's safe and effective. Now there are newer modalities that I alluded to, so-called far UV, that may allow surface and air disinfection in occupied rooms without keeping it in the upper room. And we'll talk about that. So this is the principle. We have upper room in the germs, in the upper room, we generate a very narrow beam with modern low ceilings. In the past, you could have much more open fixtures and you didn't have to worry about um, UV coming back into the room by reflection. Um, older schools, et cetera, had high ceilings and mostly because they had high windows depending on outdoor uh, lighting, et cetera. But ordinary occupied rooms generate a fair amount of heat by people, and that air goes up to the upper room, displacing air that comes back down. And if we want to really assure that the system works, we install a low velocity ceiling fan to make sure there's good air mixing. Now, in uh, this study by Grigory Volchenkov in uh, the Tomsk of rather of Vladimir, Russia, and Paul Jensen from the CDC, they commandeered a room in a hospital and uh, generated aerosol test organisms. I think it was serratia, maybe E. coli. And they compared the air cleaning capacity of three commercial air cleaners, nat mechanical ventilation, and upper room germicidal UV using locally made, um, not I would say the best design fixture ever, uh, shown in the upper figure here, but nonetheless quite effective. And in terms of cost of one equivalent air change in the patient room, uh, comparing three different air cleaners, including the Potok was a or Potok is was used in the Soyuz space capsule, very sophisticated and also very expensive, which is why the the cost per air change was quite high. But none of these, and including mechanical ventilation compared to the low cost of disinfecting air by upper room germicidal UV. And uh, Grigory puts it here in terms of relative e efficiency compared to mechanical ventilation as a 1.0, um, UV was about 9.4 times more cost effective. Now, <clears throat> here's a direct comparison to get at what I'm talking about with room air cleaners. I was giving a talk like this in uh, Pretoria, South Africa, and there was a salesperson and a device uh, with a room air cleaner. Uh, every, well, with all due apologies to engineers, with, uh, you give a engineer a problem of clearing the air and they build a fan and a box to put the air through as the first approach. And so we got the, what's called the clean air delivery rate for this device and it was 23.8 liters per second. And in a, in a hypothetical room of four meters by four meters by three meters high, that would give you about 2.1 air changes per hour. Now, obviously, if you had two of these, you'd have four air changes per hour. And if you had a smaller room, you could have uh, more air changes per hour. Uh, the point of this is that the number of interest is how many air turnovers in the room you can get. <clears throat> 
Now, if you take upper room germicidal UV with an average of 30 microwatts in the upper room, and, and, you, and just using the figure for tuberculosis, COVID, for example, is much more vulnerable to UV than tuberculosis. And with good air mixing, I'll show you data that we can produce equivalent of 20 air changes in the lower room uh, with no noise, no drafts, and very, very effectively. So um, where upper room UV should be considered for COVID, um, again, I just make mention of the controversy around how the virus is spread. We don't know how much is spread by large droplets, by small droplets, and by uh, airborne droplets uh, that don't settle. But there are a number of examples of the Washington State Chorus. There's an apartment building in, um, in Hong Kong, a restaurant in, in Wuhan, where airborne transmission was suspected. Recently, I saw a paper from China also looking at mitigation strategies and how, it, how effective wearing face covering is, suggesting in their minds that um, that was strong evidence for an aerosol component. It's not so clear that, that that's true, um, but I think that um, uh, there is a lot of evidence of airborne spread as Phil started the session with. So in areas where airborne transmission is likely, healthcare facilities, emergency room, the intensive care unit, outpatient waiting rooms, corridors, jails, shelters, nursing homes, uh, in addition to personal protective equipment uh, where that's indicated. For, for asymptomatic persons, which as you know, are suspected as playing a major role and in public buildings, in stores and restaurants and banks, we may end up seeing a lot of uh, upper room or direct lower room uh, air, air disinfection using UV because of its tremendous efficiency for large spaces. Now, I'm not going to go through uh, this great list in any detail, but the question is, if this stuff is so effective and safe, why aren't we using it more? And it's a good question. And I've been thinking about it a long time for many, many years. For a long time, people would say, well, there's no good proof of efficacy. Well, there is now, and we've contributed one of the studies on that. Fear is a big factor. We've been told since we're kids to avoid sun because UV is dangerous. And so as soon as you mention UV, people think of sunlight and, and skin cancer and cataracts. And that is just a lack of education because as you'll see, uh, upper room germicidal uh, short wavelength UV uh, is both, and it's a little contradictory, it's more biologically active but also uh, much less dangerous because it doesn't penetrate the skin and, uh, and it has limited penetration of the eye, causing uh, eye irritation that is not, has no long-term effects, but usually prevents people from further exposure. And that if, if a system is designed properly, there's no eye irritation at all. Uh, we have dosing guidelines and they're now practical and, and we've contributed some of that. Uh, there's a lack of knowledge, uh, knowledgeable experts to help you plan and commission uh, such systems, and that's true today. We've trained a lot of people at uh, School of Public Health over 10 years, but uh, still, if you wanted to go out now and, and find a consultant, you'd be hard pressed to find someone who really understands this technology. It's not rocket science at all. It's fairly simple, but you need to get people trained to do it. Um, fixtures. Um, we now have performance-based specifications. We didn't in the past. Uh, electrical supply, this applies more to developing countries. You gotta have electricity run these. And if the electricity is going out multiple times a day, we may need to wait until we get LED UV, which is on the horizon, which can run off of um, solar power or batteries. Air mixing, not an issue. We can easily uh, achieve the air mixing needed for the upper room to work and it's not needed particularly for the whole room UV. Maintenance is a huge problem uh, in any, all over the world. These systems are not complicated to maintain, but like all systems, they need to be maintained. The lamps cleaned maybe once or twice a year and changed when needed. There's always a cost and there's a sustainability and, um, uh, of such systems, which 
Again, less of a problem in the US and in other parts of the world where oftentimes these systems are donated and then not maintained. Um, <clears throat> I'll show you proof of efficacy, proof of safety. I'll tell you a little bit about the dosing guidelines. Uh, the, uh, I'll tell you about the uh, fixture specifications that we now have. Uh, there are new fixture designs. Uh, LED is on the um, horizon, in fact, here already. Uh, and um, there are other ways to use UV besides fixtures. And now we have the FAR, um, UV, FAR UVC that is a very exciting new area. So here's a study done in uh, Lima, Peru by my colleague Rod Escom using the same system that I'll be telling you about in more detail, where we use living guinea pigs, literally guinea pigs, as uh, living air samplers for tuberculosis. And air goes to the guinea pigs on alternative days, on days when the UV is on to one colony or exposure chamber, and to days with UVs off to the other one. And what uh, Rod found in, in Lima, Peru, that UVGI reduced um, uh, the efficacy by 72%. Ionizers were also used and that had much, were much less effective. Actually, there's a correction which Rod did not do for double hits. Uh, people who do air sampling will know what I'm talking about. Um, a statistical correction, which would bring it about up to 80%. I mentioned that because that's exactly what we found as well. Uh, which is pretty much, I think, the ceiling of where you're gonna get with most air disinfection devices because of how they work on what's called first order kinetics, um, where you're always killing a fraction of what's left and it gets increasingly harder to get down to zero. This is the air facility in South Africa that I was responsible for uh, putting together in uh, 2005, and it's been operating since that time. Uh, we're pretty much out of funding at the moment and the equipment is getting old but it's a part of an MDR-TB hospital you see up in the left, upper left corner. Uh, there are three two-patient beds in this wing, and so we have six patients, and the air goes from this ward to two exposure chambers for guinea pigs, and here you see in the cutaway uh, cages for guinea pigs and a guinea pig having its skin test measured. Uh, so guinea pigs are exquisitely sensitive to tuberculosis, and they can be used to quantify how much tuberculosis is in the air, not by PCR, which is telling you that there's maybe a living or maybe a dead uh, organism. This tells you there's an infectious organism and that it in fact caused an infection. So it's, it's pretty much an ideal controlled uh, setup for studying interventions, not only um, UV, but we studied masks on patients and a variety of other methods at this facility over the last 15 years. Um, this is the setup in the hospital. We had air coming from the ventilation system into the room and going back here, more or less at breathing level. And we had upper room UV fixtures pictured here and a simple, uh, very inexpensive ceiling fan as well to assure mixing. Uh, this is the setup. And by the way, Saul Permit, who some of the folks at Harvard School of Public Health know from his work at Hopkins, was a uh, brilliant experimentalist. I invited he and Richard Riley to a, a meeting in um, San Francisco in 1993, and on the back of a napkin, Saul described this experiment that I should do, and it took 10 years to uh, get around to it, 2005, actually it's more than 10 years, um, and, uh, but I finally did it where he described every other day you turn on the UV lights or any other intervention, you send the air to one guinea pig colony when the intervention is on to the other guinea pig colony when it's off and you get a um, very controlled study, not worrying about the infectiousness of the patients varying from data, from a control to intervention study there. But at the end of two months, uh, these guinea pigs on one side would have breathed only the air when the UV was on, and these guinea pigs breathe only the air when the UV is off. So these are the results. Um, we had to do this in two phases, but at the end of the day, there were 48 control guinea pig infections and 15 in the intervention room. There was a combined hazard ratio of about five, which indicated about 80% efficacy 
And if you convert this to mechanical changes, and if, if the engineers on the, uh, who are watching will un know that one air change uh, under well mixed conditions removes about 63% of the contaminants. The next air change removes 63% of what's left, and so on. This is the first order kinetics we've been talking about. And so um, <clears throat> we say that if, if we got 84% reduction, we'd have the equivalent of two air changes, and we call that equivalent air changes. So this system added the equivalent of 24 air changes to the system, the very, very high levels of air disinfection. Now, this is published in this paper, and I keep forgetting to put the citation on here, but it's easily found. Um, I'm the last author, and uh, Matsi is the first author, uh, again, describing this experiment. In And what we did with this study was uh, the subtitle is a basis for dose, dosing guidelines. We used that as the evidence for our dosing, as you'll see. Now, in terms of safety, uh, we confined this to the upper room, very high levels of UV in the upper room, and what gets to the lower room is usually reflected. And the ACGIH has a TLV, which you see here, and we keep the lower room to within certain guidelines by commissioning the system before we start at the, uh, uh, having it occupied. And if you keep that, people don't get eye irritation, they don't get any long-term effects, and they don't get any risk for skin cancer or cataracts. Um, I'm not going to read this in detail. This is the International Illumination Society that I mentioned earlier. This is their official statement on photocarcinogenesis risk factors. And they simply say that the only consequences of upper room germicidal is transient um, uh, irritation of the conjunctiva or of the skin, no long-term effects, that in accidents do happen when people climb up on a ladder and look directly into these fixtures. Um, uh, there are some documents that say UV is carcinogenic. I don't know what the UV are. That should be just say UV is carcinogenic. All UV radiation is carcinogenic. But uh, in fact, it isn't all. Uh, UVB in sunlight is what is carcinogenic. UVC simply doesn't penetrate the outer dead layer of skin to get to the basal cells. And so it doesn't cause skin cancer. It doesn't reach the lens, it causes cataracts either. Uh, Mel first and uh, I did a study of many, many people exposed to upper room germicidal at a nearby hospital and in various other settings. And the highest percentage of a TLV that we re record on a personal monitor was about a third. Um, and so people are not being overexposed to upper room germicidal. And again, you see why that these modern fixtures produce a narrow beam. In fact, they do too good a job of it, rendering some of these fixtures incredibly inefficient, although safe. Some fixtures, this one designed in South Africa, have very wide louvers and actually were unsafe uh, and could not be used with low ceilings. In high ceilings, they'd be fine. So in 2009, uh, NIOSH produced a, a, a review of uh, uh, upper room germicidal UV following some studies that they funded. And they came up with a number of dosing guidelines. And here you see a whole variety of them. None of these were very practical in terms of actually applying them. And we came up from that study I showed you with 12 milliwatts of total UV fixture output per room volume. And that's what we're using today. And so if you had a room of 10 by 5 by 3 meters, you would uh, uh, ca calculate a volume of uh, 150 square uh, cubic meters. And using this formula, you'd say you need 1.8 watts. Our, the better of two fixtures puts out a half a watt. It means you need four fixtures. You put them on the walls in the upper room, about 7 feet above the floor. Um, and you uh, orient them toward the longest ray length, not across the room because this, that UV is going to be absorbed by the wall. Put them across the room for longest ray length. And that is a paper that Steve Rudnick and Mel First did called Fundamental Factors. And uh, you need to know how much UV is coming out of the fixture. You need to know uh, how much, and you have to assure mixing, which is easy. And you have to um, 
uh, use the longest relands rather than the shorter one. There are more sophisticated ways to figure out dosing. We have a validated visual uh, CAD program, computer assisted design program, uh, which we've worked on with Acuity Lighting, and that's available for free and gives you clouds of UV irradiance in the upper room from which you can calculate uh, the average irradiance in the room, uh, all kinds of things, and you just put your room CAD into the program and then you can figure out how things work. Um, as I mentioned, not all fixtures are the same. These fixtures were designed to be safe, and they were too safe because they are so incredibly inefficient. Uh, a better design fixture is shown here, about 10 times more efficient. And so we're looking to, for more efficient fixtures. If you look at the cutaway here of this fixture, you see that of a fluorescent lamp, and that's all a UV lamp is, is a fluorescent lamp with special glass to allow the 254 radiation out uh, quartz or bicor glass, that the only UV we get really useful comes off the back of the lamp bouncing off the parabolic reflector and through the louvers. That coming off the first, mostly front of the lamp, mostly gets caught up in these louvers. And so uh, at best we have very low efficiency because of the need for safety. If the room ceilings are low, if they're high, we can do much better. Now we now uh, measure the total fixture uh, output of the fixture using lighting laboratory techniques, uh, gonio radiometry or integrated sphere. So every fixture you buy, you should know how much UV comes out of it. Now, this is a novel fixture designed by a famous lighting designer, Howard Branston. Up to this time, mostly fixtures were designed by amateurs. And so this fixture has never been built commercially, but there is a company now interested in doing it, and Howard has donated the design free of, and what he's doing here is capturing the UV that comes off the front and the back of the lamp without uh, losing it as much th to the louvers. Now, uh, this is a, a laboratory we had on the top of the School of Public Health for many years. It was recently condemned and torn down, unfortunately, where we would put UV fixtures and aerosolized test organisms and sample them. And this is one of our graduate students, um, Sonia Lenova, who did a lot of these studies with under uh, Steve Rudnick's supervision. Now, um, almost done. And uh, so LED, uh, you all know LED from your uh, flashlights, et cetera. They do make LED UVs. Up until very recently, they were limited to these longer wavelengths of 265 to 270, highly germicidal, but also more irritating. The result is we would probably end up using half as much and be in the same a position of, of around similar kind of efficacy and safety, but with a little less um, um, margin of error in terms of exposure people in the lower room. There is promise of 222 nanometer uh, UV on the horizon for LED, and a lot of products are being built with that promise in mind. Uh, here's a device in the lower room where you stand on it in the operating room, and you're standing on LEDs, essentially, that are disinfecting the soles of the feet where people are carrying in um, organisms into the operating room or into isolation rooms or out of isolation rooms. And I actually think that this is a reasonable use of LEDs uh, for, for disinfection of surfaces. I'll show you some that are not. This is a first uh, test um, LED wall fixture built for us. It's currently being tested in South Africa in a chamber that's similar to the one we had here. And um, these are now outmoded LEDs, but the, the principle remains. Now, um, I'm gonna skip over uh, egg crate UV. It's another way of using UV with nearly bare lamps and a egg crate ceiling that prevents the UV from reaching the lower room. Again, not been used very much, but, uh, and, uh, but we published this and showed great efficacy once you get those louvers off the lamps. Uh, and, we, and so here's the spectrum of UV, 280, 290, where we now have some LEDs. 265, 270 is peak of um, um, what we think of the, this whole area is a very uh, cause of irritation. And then the bactericidal 
peak, which is close to 254. And then these lower wavelengths, which we've never really bothered much with. Um, but now there's this far UVC uh, put out by excimer lamps. Here pictured an excimer lamp. It looks like a UV lamp. And uh, puts out a spike of UV around 220, 222. You have to be careful that there isn't longer wavelength UV in here, even at low levels, because that can cause irritation. The feature of far UVC is that it does not penetrate skin at all and does not penetrate even the outer layer of the eye. So this can be used directly in rooms without any upper room um, limitation. And uh, is said to be as germicidal and in some people's hands more germicidal uh, because it may be working on other proteins rather than DNA, which is what the mechanism by which uh, UVC works. It's early days. Um, David Brenner at, at Columbia has done a lot of work on this. He's got a colony of, of mice that are being continually exposed to 222 and they're not seeing any eye changes or skin changes at all. It, the same beneficial factor that it doesn't penetrate may limit its uh, surface decontaminating properties, but you wouldn't know it from the property from the products that are being proposed. For example, this is from the, the Wall Street Journal two days ago, and a company is making the Cleanse Portal, and a, a bakery in New York was planning to put this in Marigold Bakery, uh, where you would walk through this uh, and on the way to the bakery, and it was do a little twist of a turn in here and supposedly be disinfected. Well, far UV has very limited penetration. It surfaces, UV is not a great surface disinfectant. It does work on smooth surfaces and at high intensity. But to me, this is an absurd use of UV technology. And it's now off their website after they may have gotten a few uh, uh, nasty comments uh, in some interviews. Um, from yours truly. Um, so anyway, um, not, not a way to use UV. Uh, current limitations of, uh, of um, FAR UV is availability. There's three or four manufacturers in the world. Sterol Ray is the original originator and holds the patents on 222 for air and surface sterilization. A lot of people are in, in, apparently in, infringing on those patents right now, may challenge them. Eden Park makes a small low power array. Usho in Japan is teaming up with Acuity, the largest US manufacturer of fixtures. And you're gonna be seeing a lot of, of that in the fall. And I've heard there's a South Korean source, I don't know about, much about it. These fixtures cost about $2,000 each. A UV lamp and its fixture cost about $800 or so and in volume less. Um, big differences in these products, they're not made all the same. Sterile Ray claims and guarantees 30,000 hours. Lucio and Eden Park, two or 3,000 hours. Um, and <clears throat> there's many places where this could be used directly in the, in the lower room um, without and achieving some surface disinfection, we hope, and some uh, air and good air disinfection, but a lot more research is needed, and yet these things are being sold readily. So my last slide, Upper room germicidal is well established, safe, and highly effective method for air disinfection to be implemented today. There's availability of upper room fixtures. They've been in great demand, but they're available. We know that COVID is quite susceptible to at very low levels of UV. It's mostly studies on COVID-1, almost identical virus, as you know, the SARS virus. Um, high intensity UV surface disinfection is also a well established uh, practice for unoccupied rooms in hospitals. Um, far UVC may combine safe air and surface disinfection, um, but it is very new, and the surface part may be impaired even by such things as the oil in your hands or the skin, scales of your skin that are associated with the virus on surfaces. That remains to be seen. We know it works in the lab, but real life surfaces may be different. And we don't know much about dosing it, although again, it seems to be about as germicidal as UVC of the 254 variety. Additional research is needed. 